Welcome to Global Connections with Robert Siegel, presented by the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, AFRMC, a 501c3 national charitable organization based in New York City. We at AFRMC represent Israel's premier hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Tel Aviv. The hospital serves 1 million patients annually from all ethnic and religious backgrounds with the same compassionate care. Please support our mission. Join our community of friends. Visit American Friends of Rabin Medical Center online, afrmc.org, via our website, and visit us on social media outlets on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Our host and moderator is Robert Siegel, the former host of All Things Considered on National Public Radio for 30 years. Over the course of an hour each month, Global Connections features three to four guests who Robert Siegel interviews as they explore important issues and challenges in our world arising from the global pandemic. Today's Global Connections topic is education during the pandemic. The special guest, Dr. Robert Zimmer, president of the University of Chicago, Dr. Mike Looney, superintendent of Fulton County Schools in the Atlanta area and Anya Kamenetz, National Public Radio's education correspondent. And now, Global Connections with Robert Siegel. Thank you, Josh. Uh, we speak in this series of navigating the new abnormal. And over the past several months, very few areas of our national life have sailed such turbulent abnormal waters as education. An elementary school turns out to be not just a house of learning that instructs and socializes our children, uh, it's also a daycare center that permits the children's parents to work. Uh, it's the cafeteria that provides school lunches uh, to kids who might otherwise face malnutrition. It's the school nurse who might pick up on uh, children's problems ranging from flu to in some cases child abuse at home. Well, a university uh, turns out to be a very complex place too. And uh, the pressures on universities and colleges these days are immense. The job of university president is tougher than ever. Uh, and we are going to start in college uh, by talking with Robert Zimmer, uh, who is a mathematician by training, who used to be provost at Brown University and ever since 2006 has been uh, president of the University of Chicago. Uh, Bob Zimmer, welcome. Uh, first, sure. I, I want you to tell us uh, how open or how virtual the University of Chicago is right now as you face the start of the, so of the fall semester. Right. Well, in the, in the spring, we went totally remote. So students went home from the residence halls. Uh, the, uh, all classes were in quarters, so it was the spring quarter. Uh, all classes were done remotely, and the uh, research labs were also closed because, again, all of these because we wanted to avoid close proximity and uh, observe appropriate social distancing. Uh, we, um, like every other institution, uh, has struggled with the question of how does one think about the fall? And we are now approaching uh, September, although our quarter doesn't start to till the beginning of October, with the plan, an extensive amount of work was done on this, that we are going to be open and that classes will be a bit of a hybrid that uh, faculty will also be able to choose because it's not just students who may be concerned about their health, but faculty are concerned about their health. Uh, typically older mm -hmm. than students and uh, therefore a little bit more vulnerable, many with pre-existing physical conditions. So uh, we are creating what I would say is a as open an environment as possible with built-in flexibility to accommodate people's concerns about, uh, about their health. And as the president, as the president of the university, uh, the president of the University of Chicago, uh, uh, Dr. Zimmer, the, the bill for all this comes to your desk at some point. I want you to give us some sense 
just in terms of, of managing an institution and its, its budget, uh, what the economic crisis of 2020 has meant for, say, your university? Yeah, it's, it is a huge issue. You look at every single revenue source, major revenue source that a university has, has been challenged, whether um, it's direct by students not being in the residence halls, and we now have all these buildings that are empty, uh, or it's a second order effect due to the economic downdraft, and then you have issues around uh, endowment returns, uh, questions about philanthropy and so on. So, and uh, also the hospital, we, um, we operate a hospital that in some sense we own um, through the University of Chicago Medical Center. And uh, again, the, uh, the nature of the way the hospitals have run has had to be changed dramatically to accommodate for COVID, but has also meant that other people have had a harder time getting into the hospital. So every one of these things is a huge challenge and it runs, uh, you know, runs to over a hundred million dollars a year in, in challenge. And uh, that's a, not a trivial amount of money by any means. And uh, uh, even for a big organization, it's a lot of money. And so it's a very significant challenge. Of course, tuition is a major source of revenue to pay for all of those bills. And uh, uh, I, I wonder, I'm sure you've heard from students or perhaps from students' parents, uh, why, why am I paying this much for a University of Chicago education uh, that is now taking place uh, uh, virtually rather than the education that involved uh, a student commingling with other students getting to know a few uh, professors, personally experiencing the, the, uh, the, the community of academic life. Yeah, and that is a challenge that, uh, that we all face. I mean, one of the, when you really think about what, what are some of the key things a university provides, one of them is an environment uh, along the lines you say, where people are, uh, are seeing, students not just in classes but out the students interacting with each other outside class and arguing about what happened in class and uh yeah. discussing and bringing up different points of view and perspectives this is an important part of uh overall activity at a at a university and certainly um you know it's it is a kind of thing that that people I mean, do, do, do you have to sit down and say it's still worth 100 percent, 80 percent, 50 percent of what we're what we're charging? Well, I mean, there's education? there's still an awful lot that students get. I mean, that's one aspect, but there are a lot of aspects to what's available for students and um, and a lot of remains available. I mean, there's, uh, we, we all recognize that we would prefer not to be doing things remotely, or at least to have the opportunity not to do them remotely. It may be that some things are done well remotely, and that you want to do them remotely. But there are some things that, that you miss. And, um, you know, how much part of the whole experiment that's been going on, and what we had in the spring and a lot of places had is you now have a faculty that is learning how to deliver education extremely well remotely. And as with everything, uh, you know, you practice at it, you get better at it. And I would say that faculty have been surprised uh, some of them surprised at how well it's gone and how well they've been able to do having a class remotely. Um, some say, yeah, it's, it's way better than I thought. I'd still prefer to be in the room. Okay, certainly get that and, uh, and so on. So is it a generational split, by the way? I mean, do you find that the younger faculty are more at ease with, uh, with these technologies than, than older faculty or no? Um, a little bit, but there, there's a lot of uh, 
older one, shall we say. Uh, in age, I appreciate that um, <laughs> that uh, are also finding the challenge and figuring out how to use this methodology to do more exciting. This methodology uh, is something you've been using by necessity because of the pandemic. That's right. Uh, do you see uh, techniques uh, acquired, lessons learned that are going to uh, have a role for the University of Chicago after the pandemic that you started doing during this year by necessity? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's, and I think there are two ways I'd point out. One is simply that faculty now know more about this and they've thought about it way more. And so just in the ordinary course of, a, of, of teaching a course, they may discover that there are things they want to do remotely and don't necessarily have to do in class or is better to do remotely. Now, you know, that's going to depend on faculty to faculty and member. And we always count on our faculty to be figuring out how to do their class. And as they develop a lot more experience, uh, they're going to have another arrow in their quiver and I expect many will use it. Now, so has, there, has there actually been an unusual degree of thinking about pedagogy over this, over these past several months about how you should teach? What, what, what um, I would say is? it's, it's developing. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are a set of activities where people really are trying to think this through, develop best practices and, uh, and so on. Just spoke to the provost about this yesterday. And so this is a, a very active work in progress because I think it's, uh, it's important. Now there's one other critical uh, area and that concerns the question of who are your students and what's the nature of what you're doing. Uh, there's a lot of what are often called non-traditional students, people not necessarily seeking a degree um, this can be alumni, it can be anybody who's just interested in something, sometimes people who want uh, to learn something relevant to their professional life, sometimes driven more by personal interest. And um, obviously, the becoming more capable around doing things remotely offers a considerable expansion of the possibilities of, of doing this and having larger numbers of students of, let's say, non-traditional age for being standard students at a, uh, at a university. And I think this is a very important thing as people recognize that lifelong education is a good thing. It's not as if your education should be confined to uh, four particular years of your life and otherwise, uh, hopefully you actually still read some books, but that, there's a, um, that there is a way in which a more formal structure is still of great value to people at a later stage of, of their life, sometimes more complicated stage of their life. And um, I think that, the, um, that this particular experience that so many faculty have had uh, open of uh, doing teaching remotely will open up these possibilities greatly. Now, of course, there have been lots of, uh, lots of activities in, in this type of directions how does technology enable us to reach more people? Uh, there have been uh, firms like Coursera started uh, and uh, some institutions that are putting a lot of their courses just online. So this idea that technology can help you reach and project an outstanding educational experience to way more people is not new. On the other hand, what this experience of having of the whole university going remote for, uh, for a quarter has done is it's, it's moved this away from 
Well, yeah, there are a few people around the university who think this is really interesting and want to try to do a MOOC, mm -hmm. something where everybody now is experiencing it, everybody's thinking about it, and it just creates a lot more opportunity because ultimately, you know, you're about, uh, your, your educational offerings depend on your faculty. We're going to return to, to several of these points in the course of the hour, but Robert Zimmer, our president of the University of Chicago, thank you. And thank stick you. around for the Q&A that's uh, coming up in around, around 20 minutes or so. I will. The uh, pandemic has also wrought havoc with our public schools. Uh, they've been torn between pressures to stay uh, virtual for the health and safety of both students and teachers, and also to reopen as fully as possible to allow parents to get back to work. Well, Dr. Mike Looney uh, faces those conflicting pressures uh, as the school superintendent of schools in Fulton County, Georgia. That's where most of Atlanta uh, is. Before that, he ran the schools in Williamson County, Tennessee. That's a suburban county uh, south of uh, Nashville. Uh, Superintendent Looney, thanks for joining us. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, always interesting uh, to talk about the pandemic and, and how it's impacted public schools across the country and specifically here in Fulton County. Yeah, you've got 93 students in your system. Uh, and uh, tell us first, what's the status quo? How uh, open, how virtual are Fulton County Schools? Thank you for the question. We opened on August the 17th, 100% virtually. One caveat, though, is that all of our teachers and employees have been reporting to work uh, in preparation for students' return uh, to prepare them for the, the new way that we're going to be doing business, which is social distancing, wearing a mask, thinking about how we will manage students when they do return to buildings. Uh, our current plan is a phased in approach where students are expected to begin to return in small groups uh, on September 8th. And then periodically, uh, based on where the data takes us, we will bring in more students for longer periods of time, ultimately to get back to traditional schooling, hopefully by the end of uh, uh, the first nine weeks or so. What, what do you say to the parent who says, if, if my child is physically in school for just a few hours a week, that means I can only work for a few hours a week? Well, that's one of the unfortunate realities of the, of the pandemic. Um, we, we, we recognize that, that this has impacted families in untold ways and businesses in untold ways. But at the end of the day, in order for the society uh, to go back to, to normal, we have to be able to open schools safely and prudently. Um, and we can't be in the position to open and close and open and close because of flare-ups. So we think a more deliberate approach to reopening is, uh, is, the, is the best way to go long-term. It yeah. certainly the, creates some short-term discomfort. The hopeful scenario here is that the metrics look good, uh, the rate of infection uh, uh, declines, and more and more uh, children come back from more and more face-to-face uh, -face learning in schools. Uh, do you similarly have a worst case plan, which is you, you make a U-turn and send fewer kids to school because the rates of infection have increased? Well, our district created both a reopening plan and a school closing plan based on where the data takes us. And so in March, when we first closed, we shut the entire district down and, and began remote learning. Since that time, we've learned where we can be a little bit more precise and, and tactical in, in, in how we approach school closures based on a couple of things. One, the level of community spread, and two, the number of cases that we're dealing with in specific schools, campuses, and or regions of our school district. So our approach moving forward will be a little bit more deliberative and a little bit more precise, but we do recognize um, there are gonna be times when the rate of infection in a school or in the region or even the broader community will necessitate us closing barring some uh, intervening variable, such as a vaccine or something like that. So, so far as you can uh, judge these things, what, what impact has this year of the pandemic had on, uh, on the learning uh, that gets done in school uh, or the, the, the achievement of, of students in the Fulton County schools? Well, first and foremost, I, I wanna say that our teachers have been nothing short of spectacular. Um, they've done the very best they can learning new processes and new skill sets in order to make sure that we minimize the loss of, of learning opportunity for our students. But to be perfectly candid, we've been very transparent with our community, and that is our students are not making the same academic gains as they otherwise would have made if traditional schooling had taken place. 
And so we recognize that we have some ground to make up. What we're trying to do is, is I guess, rather selfishly here in Fulton County, and that is we're trying to make sure that our students um, learn as much as they can and, and lose less ground than their peers from neighboring districts and across the region. Uh, we have implemented uh, this past summer a learning recovery model where uh, we had more students that participated in virtual summer school than we've ever had in Fulton County because we, we anticipate uh, recovering from the loss of learning opportunity is going to be a multiple year project and we wanted to get started right away. So even in the summer ahead, we will be um, adding additional summer school programming, uh, not just for the sake of, uh, you know, helping students make up um, work that they didn't master, but also moving ahead and making sure they recapture some of the gains that they would have made had traditional school be taken place. But, but even, uh, well, for the, we're talking about six months so far, but if this were to go on for another entire academic year, uh, we'd, we'd be talking about, if, if, if not a lost year, a, a compromised year of learning for millions of school children around America. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the things that we're having a conversation about in our community is learning doesn't happen exclusively in the schoolhouse. And so the more that we can um, engage our students beyond the traditional schoolhouse in the local community, this is a community wide um, issue, a societal issue that we all have to work together. And, you know, back when I first got into teaching, uh, we, we talked about the need for life experiences and how much how much life experiences adds to the learning process. And so we, we are encouraging our broader community to give students those life experiences uh, beyond the schoolhouse door. I, I can only imagine the various pressures uh, that have been brought on you uh, and other school superintendents when you've had to decide when to reopen, how to reopen, uh, what to do with the fall sports. Uh, it, have you experienced anything like it? Uh, before until this year? Well, I, I used to have black hair about six months ago. <laughs> um, no, seriously, um, th these are very, very trying times for school, school superintendents and leaders and school board members. Um, you know, we're trying to navigate through this uh, pandemic with confusing information, sometimes conflicting information, um, and with varying uh, perceptions about how to proceed. You know, we have parents that are very adamant about returning to school and having sports proceed as if nothing had happened. And then we have other community members, board members, uh, well, not board members, but uh, family members, community members, and even some of our employees who think uh, that the best thing we can do is shut down and, and, and stay at home. And, and so trying to navigate and, and please those various uh, constituencies is extremely complicated. It's not doable. So we have relegated ourselves to the notion that um, we're going to do what's best for kids based on the data and we will return to school as soon as it's safe to do so. And that includes sports. And, you know, let's face it. We're in the South and football is king. Uh, but we currently have two football programs that are on, um, you know, shut down because of exposure to COVID. And, and is there some way that you've calculated the risk of, of resuming them? That is, is, has someone figured out, if two kids catch the flu out of uh, 60 taking part in the football program, that's manageable. If uh, I'm, I'm, I'm no, not the flu, I'm speaking of the. Uh, well, I mean, one the of the things, virus. one of the challenges that we've had is um, this, the, the lack of infrastructure from the state and county level as it relates to contact tracing and getting tests back on time. So we have actually uh, stood up our own contact tracing team that works in partnership with the, the local board of health. And so when we, uh, we get a report of a positive case, we actually determine who those individuals have been around as it relates to school personnel and or other students. And we ask them to self-quarantine until such time as the Department of uh, Public and Health. And the, the, the county school system is doing that on its own, you're saying? As well, we're, to... we don't want to. That's not our primary mission. But, uh, you know, in these types uh, of, of situations, we really don't have much of a, a, chance, a choice but other than to uh, engage in that so that we can continue um, the work here in Fulton County. Well, Dr. Looney, thank you, and, and stick with us. Uh, that's Mike Looney, Superintendent of Schools in Fulton County, Georgia, which is uh, in Atlanta. We've heard now from uh, one guest who administers an institution of higher learning uh, and another who administers a system of K-12 through uh, education. Anya Kamenetz doesn't administer 
a, a school system or a university, uh, but she's here uh, to provide an overview of education in the time of the pandemic. She is education correspondent and lead education blogger at NPR, a very accomplished uh, uh, reporter there, former colleague of mine there. Uh, and she's the author of several books, including DIYU, that's Do-It-Yourself University, uh, Generation Debt, and The Never More Apt Guide to Family Media Policy, The Art of Screen Time. Uh, Anya, thanks for sharing some, uh, some screen time with us. Um, let's, let's set aside for a moment all of those non-instructional uh, aspects of school and focus on learning. Uh, do, do we, we, we've heard what, what, uh, what Mike Looney had to say, do we have any sense of what this disruption in the normal school year has meant for children across America and uh, what they're learning. So we don't have great data. One of the casualties of this disruption was in fact um, state testing across the country. Um, there was a, you know, state testing was can canceled last spring virtually everywhere. So we're not gonna have a good benchmark to compare, but you know, you can calculate that there is a loss in learning that is greater than the amount of time that students are actually home from school. So um, one of my early articles looked at the uh, the interruption in enrollment that happened with Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, which is 15 years ago today, pretty much. Um, and they found that all those students there were only out of school for a few weeks, that most of the time they were enrolled elsewhere pretty quickly. Uh, it took two years for those students, that cohort, to catch up um, to where they had been, uh, where you would expect them to be, their trajectory of learning. Um, and that's because, you know, education disruptions don't occur alone. They occur in the context of mass social disruptions, economic disruptions, and all of that really comes to bear on the progress of children in school. The irony of what happened in New Orleans after Katrina, where I spent a lot of time reporting uh, in the, for the six months after the hurricane hit, mm -hmm. was that um, the schools, which had been regarded as underperforming, right. the system was, was, was simply dismantled. All the teachers were fired. It was a pretty big political issue in, in, in Louisiana. And the new system that was created and, and brought in was regarded, at least, as a better school system than, than what the kids had left uh, uh, before, uh, uh, before Katrina. Right. Uh, even so, you say it took two years with uh, what was generally regarded as an improved public school system, although some would dispute that, uh, to get kids back to where they were because disruption of a school year isn't just about uh, not learning long division. It, it's, it's, it's about all kinds of disruptions in your life. That's exactly right. And it should be noted that uh, after that cohort of children caught up, they actually surpassed where they had been, at least as you can measure by standardized tests. So there's a lot that you can learn from that example. I think um, we're all becoming much more aware of just the crucial linchpin role that our public schools have come to play in our society, not only as childcare for millions of working parents who have um, no money out of pocket to pay now for, for appropriate care, uh, not only for uh, you know, 30 million children that depend on schools for food that they might not be getting otherwise, mental health care, and so all kinds of community supports that now that the schools are functioning, let's say intermittently or in a different way than they were before, um, there's a, such a more heightened awareness of all the functions that schools play in society. And I think, you know, New Orleans is not the only example of a time when school closures led to a wholesale reinvention of the system. And I think that, you know, we're poised obviously at a, at a place where there are many very, very different visions of what America looks like coming out of this pandemic. And I think a remaking of the public school system um, or the potentially the roles that it plays might be on the table here. If you think about things like childcare subsidies or, um, actually covering all children with health care uh, or, uh, you know, what kind of food supports, you know, just, just a payment to families um, in particular, as well as the availability of online teaching and learning um, supports for students. All of that might be uh, on, the, on the offer here. Since uh, March of 2020, uh, we've had an abundance of so-called teachable moments in American life. Um, and first, there's the biology of, uh, of the virus and the pandemic. 
Uh, then there's been the uh, the understanding of of economics, what it means to live in a in a radical economic downturn, and then of course the huge protest uh, movement over police brutality and African Americans. Uh, do you get the impression that virtual schooling has been able to offer or capture some of the discussion or some of the offer uh, of historical background to these developments that a a really engaged live uh, classroom might? I can tell you the teachers are trying. They're acutely aware of the social and emotional needs of their students and the need to ground uh, what's happening, you know, uh, and provide context. I, I talked to a, a teacher recently who teaches in the Bronx and, you know, she talked about what it was like in May and June when her students' neighborhood was literally on fire night after night and what it meant to try to create a safe space for her students to process the violence against people of color like themselves um, and what it meant for them to try to go out in the street. And she wanted to be there for them. She could be there only during video chats and it just didn't feel commensurate with the challenge. Um, then you have to understand that we have a, you know, a basic connectivity problem in the United States. There's a recent uh, report that I put out uh, that I was publicizing on Twitter, 17 million children estimated lack broadband Wi-Fi in their homes and another seven and a half million lack proper devices for, for doing school. So, you know, anytime we talk about what we can and can't do over online, you have to look at the technical issues. Uh, which, which leads us to, to another question. One of the, the overarching problems of this year has been the, uh, uh, the extent to which inequality in American life has been has been evident, whether it's in the, the disparate rates of infection uh, based on uh, living conditions and uh, occupations, or uh, whether it's uh, who loses their jobs and who can work at home, and uh, and who, for example, can form a uh, what do we call it a, a a neighborhood pod, a learning pod? I mean, you've, you've reported on the phenomenon of a group of parents creating a sort of a a pooled uh, home learning or part day camp uh, situation. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these issues seem to favor the the already advantaged, and I would imagine threaten to uh, exacerbate what are already great inequalities in American education. Of course, I mean I would say that the awareness of the inequities has never been higher, especially since uh, Black Lives Matter and their upsurging for racial justice is a in very common parlance. There are a lot of white parents right now who. Um, are caught between expressing solidarity and wanting to be on the side of equity and the irony of the decisions that they're making for their own children um, that are not necessarily including other members of their community. I don't think that this is a problem that can be solved on an individual basis, though the very fact of it is that it's a collective issue. Um, one of the phenomena that I'm reporting on uh, next week actually is we do see cities and school districts trying to create the equitable alternative to a learning pod, which is sometimes called a learning hub, where they're partnering with community organizations to create free places for children to go and get Wi-Fi, get devices, get people to help them with their remote learning and have a safe place to go during the day. You know, this is a prototype, it's an ad hoc prototype of uh, what it might look like if we had a true citywide or public alternative for childcare that was safe and, and, and available for everyone. It's very small right now, it's very patchwork, um, and that's a system that we have. So, you know, I don't think that the inequity is going to be solved just by pointing at it, but it's, it's important that the conversation is going on, I think, right now. And as for the basic question that uh, people like Superintendent Looney, whom we just heard from, uh, have to address, is it safe, how safe is it for teachers and other school employees and for children uh, to enter classrooms uh, and other uh, school rooms? Uh, mm -hmm half full of masked children, let's say. I mean, is, is there some consensus answer that you find as you talk to, to people in different school systems around the country? Uh, uh, is there absent a, a very clear national public leadership on, on this question? Is, is there still some consensus that you find or is it, does it vary radically? I would answer that question in two ways. So based on my reporting, Community transmission is everything. If you have low enough community transmission, low enough positivity rates, such as we do in New York City, 
um, you can contemplate reopening schools. If you don't have that, it's going to be a fool's errand. You're going to get cases and you're going to shut down again. Um, and we have many mounting examples now of countries in Europe and Asia that have reopened with low positivity rates with, uh, you know, precautions in place, and they haven't seen spikes in the schools specifically. There may have been cases in the schools, but the schools are not automatically causing spikes. The other way that I think it's really important to raise awareness about is childcare, particularly childcare for essential workers, has been open throughout the pandemic. So we've seen children congregated um, in uh, YMCAs is one area I looked at, also at uh, on school sites in New York City. They had 10,000 children here in the height of the pandemic being cared for in small pods. Um, there are very few, if any, outbreaks that is multiple cases or clusters associated with those childcare sites. Dr. Emily Oster at Brown University, who's an economist, has been collecting the data, the self-report data from child cares across the country. And I think understanding that precautions are very important, masking is important, distancing, hand washing, the sites that followed those protocols um, are able to operate with, uh, with very little uh, rise in local cases. So I think it's really important that school districts look at those examples and that as a whole, the nation looks at positive examples and doesn't just look at scattered reports when thinking about what is possible to do when we realize how vital it is for our children to have this kind of socialization and this um, you know, access to caring adults. Okay, that's Anya Kamenetz, uh, education correspondent for, uh, for NPR and chief education blogger, I should say. I should get with the 21st century here. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much and hang in there. I'd like to, to bring back all of our guests uh, um, here's a question for Dr. Zimmer uh, from, an, from uh, an attendee who prefers to be anonymous. How can universities lower the cost of tuition in light of the pandemic and inflation in the cost of higher education? Well, um, I would say that um, it's very difficult to lower the uh, cost of tuition. Uh, the cost of running a major university is exceedingly high and uh, continues to grow. Um, I think the most critical thing is to have a, uh, a structure whereby you can uh, assure access independent of financial capacity. So the University of Chicago like a lot of institutions like us, is expensive. There's no question about it. On the other hand, we have an enormous program in financial aid with the explicit goal that anybody who is admitted will be able to come and be able to afford it and be able to do so without having to borrow money. And we've been supported in this by our alumni and what we call the uh, Odyssey Financial Aid Program. It started by an anonymous gift uh, 14 years ago, 13, 14 years ago. And it's been uh, exceedingly important. And um, I, I think the there's not really a, a reason the tuition should go down. I mean, the tuition mm -hmm. is, um, it, it is expensive, but you're, you're getting an enormous amount of, of value and options and the nature of the education is- But let me ask you a, a question that's, yes. that's, that's being brooded about in many a household with a college age yeah. uh, student in it, uh, uh, and that is, uh, I mean, the interest in a gap year has multiplied exponentially uh, over the past few months, and lots yeah. of young people are saying, "Why should I? Why should I bother with this? It's time for a leave of absence, uh, and uh, and we'll call this year. You know, I'll I'll I'll, I'll go back and live with the parents for a uh, for a while. Um, if everybody did that, I, I assume it would be a financial disaster for for, for universities. That's correct. Uh, do you have limits on it? I mean, is, a, a, is there any Well, rule? I mean, we've had, um, we've had some students who have requested a gap year. And uh, again, in the same spirit as I tried to indicate earlier, we've tried to be flexible with people and respect 
there are various sorts of anxieties about this, that, or the other, because it is a situation that creates anxiety. There's no question about it. And uh, this is legitimate response. And uh, you know, we're trying to be as accommodating uh, as possible. So I would say that we've been accommodating to students who want a gap year, whether it's their first year uh, or they just actually want to take a leave of absence for a year. And, um, you know, we've seen some of it, but it's not been, not been overwhelming, but it's, you know, it's a question hanging out there. There's yeah. no, no doubt. This is a, a question from an attendee for Dr. Mike Looney. Uh, how do schools prevent struggling students from dropping out of school? That's a really difficult question to answer. Um, we already were struggling prior to this. Um, we have social workers that are employed in the district. Our administrators and teachers are doing everything they can, everything they can to, to build relationship and to maintain contact with those students. Um, but but we will likely see an increase in the number of students that um, for one reason or another um, choose to, to walk away from us. We hope that we can minimize it, but it's just one of those unfortunate realities of going through a pandemic. Anya, do you have any, any comments on those questions that have uh, been put to your fellow panelists? I mean, I think the financial uh, stress that uh, approaches universities is very real, as well as parents. And, and it's something I've written about for many years. I don't think that, um, you know, with all due respect, universities like University of Chicago at the very top of the heap when it comes to status are not the ones that are going to have problems. There's a whole echelon of um, private institutions with less prestige and, few, and fewer uh, dollars in their endowments that are going to be dropping off and really struggling as well as public institutions that are uh, cutting faculty and programs because of state budget crises. So, uh, you know, I think we're going to see a, a consolidation in the world of higher education. Um, consolidation to, consolidation is, is a, I mean, it's a euphemism here. Uh, what you're uh, saying is we should expect to see some colleges disappear. I think some colleges are going to disappear. Some are going to merge. There's been merges already announced. Online, as online programs grow, you know, the feasibility or the desirability of having a, a regional public institution every 50 miles down the road across a state um, may make less sense. So we may look at um, institutions that have fewer uh, facilities on the ground and a larger uh, online program, for example. This is, this is a question for Dr. Looney. How have teachers been responding to the pandemic uh, what are the procedures in place to ensure their safety? Uh, do teachers have any power in this current uh, scenario to voice their concerns uh, or actively change the design of in-person, uh, of the in-person system? So once again, our teachers have been nothing short of amazing. Uh, I'm just continually impressed with their professionalism and, and their responding to this crisis in a, in a really appropriate and professional way. Um, we as a school district have put several additional protocols in place to keep all of our employees safe. That certainly includes masking, social distancing, additional uh, cleaning uh, processes in place, changing the way airflow circulation happens in the building. We have also um, provided an additional 15 days of, of uh, quasi leave where teachers can work remotely um, if, if they're in a position where they have to take care of a child or they're needing to self quarantine and they can continue to work. Um, all of our teachers have the ability to contact me directly. They all have, all 14,000 of our employees have my personal contact information. Some of them take advantage of that, others don't. Um, we also have a process in place whereby if they have underlying conditions, they can request specific accommodations under the uh, ADA um, and, you know, most of our teachers um, have come back to work and, and started teaching and have expressed that they feel safe and secure and are happy to be back in their work environment, albeit that the students are still at home. Um, but we do have a number of teachers that, that have expressed concern and fear. Um, and, you know, we empathize with them. We hear them. Uh, we value their opinion. But at the end of the day, in order for school to return, we have to have teachers back in the, in the workplace engaging students and, and to, to grow accustomed to um, 
being back in a setting with these new standards prior to students returning? Uh, this is a question that I'm, it's, it's being posed to both Dr. Zimmer and Dr. Looney, uh, and it is what skill sets will you be looking for in teachers or professors uh, for teaching in the post-COVID period? Will you, will you provide or subsidize training uh, to acquire these skills? Uh, let's start with, with uh, Robert Zimmer. Yeah, um, it's sort of a complicated question, but um, I would say that a, a, a primary driver of who's teaching our students is the level of expertise they have in the field they're teaching in that uh, this and their ability to be able to communicate this in a way that students are challenged to think about this, not just to absorb information. And this is fundamentally, from our point of view at least, what education is about. It's not just a matter of transmitting information. If it was just transmitting information, Digital computers are a fantastic device for transmitting information, as uh, everyone in, uh, in print journalism and in the music business, different types of information, but everybody's learned that uh, very well. But um, I would say take a university like the University of Chicago, our primary educational mission is um, is teaching people how to think, developing intellectual skills and habits of mind, and being able to apply that in a wide variety of domains, which means an exposure to wide variety of uh, modes of inquiry and, and so on. And that is fundamentally what we're about. And so when you're looking at who's teaching, uh, that's Fundament, that, that was the fundamental issue and will remain the fundamental issue. Yeah. And now, Dr. Looney, I mean, what I'm reminded of by this question is the fact that uh, my father was a high school teacher turned administrator. Uh, and as he advanced, he would have to uh, go through various tests and interviews, including classroom tests. I mean, should, should we assume that a skill that we would expect of a, of a teacher in the coming years uh, should be how to teach uh, virtually, or how to incorporate uh, technology, new technology, uh, into uh, into a lesson plan. Of course, and, and the reality is, many of our many of our neophyte teachers that are coming to us for the first time do have a skill set that's uh, you know steeped in in the use of technology. Um, from my perspective, the skills that we're looking at for for future employees is one flexibility uh, to deal with uncertainty but also to, to, to recognize that we're in, the, we're in the people business. We're in the relationship business first. Uh, I'm not looking for the people with the greatest content knowledge. Um, we can build content knowledge as we go along, uh, recognizing that uh, we, in order to be successful in, in, in not just a COVID environment, but in today's environment, we have to be in the relationship business. We have to value other people's, other people's perspective and uh, be willing to work in a diverse and, and a complex dynamic environment and certainly um, having technology skills as a plus. I will say though, in my, my humble opinion, the teaching profession is changing in this way. Um, the students um, have a voice and add value to what happens in the classroom. And so not a teacher being humble enough to, to recognize that it's important for students to have a voice in what happens in the classroom uh, is is critically important. I'd I'd, um, I'd 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 like to ask a question of of, of all of you, um, uh, and perhaps we'll do so in the way of the way of wrapping up. Uh, it's been a few months, uh, and it's been a few months of very trying uh, uh, times for people administering schools, whether they're elementary schools or research universities. Uh, there have been terrible financial strains. There have been terrible family strains. And I'm just wondering if you have in your, in your mind some 
some length of time uh, which we can, through which we could continue making do as we've been doing, uh, through which we could continue improvising, some point, a year, a year and a half, where frankly it breaks down our system, where we just, we just could not continue to uh, call this an effective education system if it goes on for for a certain amount of time is there some is there some duration that you have in your mind uh when when uh, when i pose that question and anya i'll i'll i'll, I'll start with you does this feel like a, something that's sustainable for another full school year or um something that starts to crack in the in in in, in the spring what, what would you say I mean, it sounds like you're asking when we're going to go back to normal. And uh, the fact is that, you know, it's, I don't think that's no, but, for a long time. But, 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 but what I'm asking also is if we don't get back to normal, is mm -hmm. there some limit to our capacity to, uh, to, to navigate this abnormal when we just throw the oars in at some point? Um. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's really more about percentages. You know, how many children are going to be completely forgotten and, uh, and deprived of a proper education by this? There's always going to be some percentage of children who are insulated by privilege and maybe even, might even thrive under these circumstances if they have a, a full-time caregiver at home, they have resources, they have someone who can, you know, teach them, they might come out ahead. And there are already many, many children who have been completely left behind. Students who aren't receiving special education services, English language, who don't have connectivity, don't have a stable place to live. Um, I guess the question is how many children are we going to write off or, or see as expendable? And then how many, re what resources are we going to invest to try to bring them back um, to at least where they were before this pandemic hit? Mike Looney, uh, do you have some mind as to uh, some some duration in mind as to how long you could keep up like this especially if the if the metrics went back and forth and uh, didn't stabilize in a positive way well we're in it to win it and so we'll, we're going to stay with it as long as it takes we're not going to give up on our students and our employees um, i think one of the important things that we teach students is resilience and so for however long it takes um, i will say that we're not going to idly stand by we're doing everything that we can to uh, compel our community to give us an environment, a safe environment where we can resume the school. But, um, you know, if we're in this for another year, so be it. We're going to do our very best to make sure that our students uh, get as much out of this experience uh, as, as possible and continue to focus on their social emotional health as well. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing is uh, depression is on the rise. Students are feeling isolated um, and helpless. And so we are being proactive and engaging in and um, and specific lessons writing around social emotional health as well. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we can only uh, provide services in the manner in which the community affords us the opportunity to do so. And Professor Robert Zimmer. Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, just uh, echo some of the things that have been said by the uh, other two panels here. With, with respect to Michael's comments, I, I agree that we, we have to be in this for as long as it takes. And it's not going to be homogeneous, which is some things we may just figure out and we figure out how to do it and we do that. And then there'll be other things that are either new or present longer term challenges and it may take longer to figure those out. But we've just got to stay with it. Uh, we can't um, uh, we can't despair. Uh, we can't lose focus on what our mission is. I mean, we have a real mission that is important to people and how they're going to be able to fulfill themselves in their lives and what the trajectory of their family is going to be. So we have to stay with it and. Um, and I just totally agree with that. Uh, Anya has more than once made what I think is a very important point, which is that when one talks about higher education, and say nothing about education in general, but even just taking higher education, it's really very heterogeneous. It's not, it's not as if 
there's one thing called higher education. There are many types of institutions, many types of students, and exactly how it all plays out will vary from one type of institution to the mm-hmm. other. And um, you know, some of the heterogeneity in students is because people are different and that's fine. And then there are more challenging ones around uh, the, the nature of the question of, are we as a society really taking care of everybody as we should? And that's obviously a more challenging question for us. And um, not, not a surprise that many people, including me, yep. uh, think we're not where we need to be in that, in that regard. Well, R- Robert Zimmer, President of the University of Chicago, uh, Dr. Mike Looney, Superintendent of Schools in Fulton County, Georgia, and Anya Kamenetz of NPR. Uh, thanks to, to all three of you for taking part in this, in this webinar. Also, uh, thanks to our Global Connections partner, Yuval Rose of Digital Asset uh, and his team. Uh, and many thanks to Joshua Plout, Nate Banzani, and uh, Roni Gibigliano from American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, which sponsors this program. The American Friends of Rabin Medical Center uh, is a 501c3 national charitable organization. Uh, It represents in the United States, uh, Israel's largest hospital, Rabin Medical Center. The group's website is www.afrmc, that's American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, .org. See you next month at Global Connections, navigating the new abnormal. I'm Robert Siegel. Uh, Stay healthy and stay safe. Bye-bye.